Hello and welcome to our district 5 residents of CPS town hall. I want to quickly thank CPS energy for agreeing to put together these town halls throughout the city. It's so important that our public utility host events like these. So our residents are on the same page regarding the proposed rate increase. My name is Terry Castillo and I'm your district 5 city council member. And I appreciate the effort that CPS has put to ensure that our residents are informed. In attendance with us this afternoon, we have CPS Energy CEO Rudy Garza, Chief Financial Officer Corey Kushnik, Vice Chair Jamie Gonzalez. And again, I want to thank you all for making yourselves available to ensure that we have a productive conversation around the proposed rate increase. For those of us attending virtually, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and one of our District 5 or CPS Energy staffers will make sure that these questions are forwarded over to us. I look forward to listening to her, how our residents feel about the proposed rate increase and any questions they may have and any information that CPS Energy is going to provide us. Uh, lastly, I want to quickly remind everyone in attendance that, CP, that City Council rather approved ARPA dollars to go towards utility, utility, utility assistance. Um, for anyone in attendance that needs assistance with their utility bill, remember that you can visit cpsenergy.com forward slash assistance or head to uplift.saws.org. Um, and I want to invite everyone to give public comment on Thursday. The city is now validating parking if you participate in public comment. And I'll hand it over to Rudy. Again, good afternoon. My name is uh, Janie Gonzalez. I'm happy to be uh, here today. I actually grew up attending here uh, vocational Bible study in the summer, so it's good to be here. It's also good to be here with my uh, distinguished uh, councilwoman, Terry Castillo. It's an honor to work with her. We're both from the neighborhood. We're both alumni from Burbank, and we really care about what happens here. And so I look forward to hearing from you. You know that I represent you, not just in town hall meetings. Anytime you want to reach out to me at CPS, please do so. I'm here to work with, again, Councilwoman Castillo to ensure that we meet the needs of District 5. And again, I just want to reiterate that you please call 210-353-2222. Again, that is 210-353-2222. And that is, again, for utility assistance. And we are here to support you. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing how we can help you. Well, good morning, and I want to start off uh, again. I'm Rudy Garza. I'm the interim uh, president and CEO of CPS Energy. Uh, I want to thank Vice Chair Gonzalez for uh, being with us today. I certainly want to give uh, a shout out to our Councilwoman Castillo. Uh, she's a great representative of uh, District 5 uh, at City Council. She's passionate. She's engaged. You know, she's inquisitive. And uh, I just want to thank you for giving us an opportunity to get in front of your constituents today, Councilwoman. So thank you uh, for allowing us to participate. Uh, again, uh, I, I took over at CPS Energy at the request uh, of our board uh, a couple months ago. And I wanna thank Janie for giving, giving uh, me an opportunity to lead during what's been a, a really challenging time for CPS Energy. Uh, over the last, you know, really three years, we've seen uh, some pressure uh, on our financial condition at CPS Energy. It's been eight years. We've had one rate increase uh, in the last 12 years. That was uh, eight years ago. Uh, you know, by by just by contrast, uh, if you look at our sister utility saws, they've had eight increases in the last 10 years due to you know some water investment that that they've needed to make. So you know, CPS Energy is is, is has taken kind of a much different trajectory over the years uh, than our sister utility has, uh, and we've done that by um, you know trying to be as efficient as we can be. We have uh, cut over $900 million out of our budget uh, over the last decade. That has allowed us uh, year over year to try to continue to tighten our belts. Uh, we've been under a mandatory hiring freeze, except for uh, linemen and critical personnel that we absolutely have to have uh, to operate our system. Uh, but you know, over that time, over the last few years that uh, we have been in a hiring freeze, you know, we've seen uh, uh, folks retire, we've seen folks leave the organization, move on to other uh, opportunities. And so we're about 400 employees down right now. Uh, but those are just, you know, kind of, you know, symptoms of um, a utility that, um, you know, is certainly uh, experiencing some financial constraints. Uh, over, you know, and again, you know, over the last eight years, we've seen, uh, if you compare kind of us to the consumer price index, 
you know, the consumer price index has increased over that time about 30%. So what that means for CPS Energy is, you know, we're paying today's prices to serve our community. We're recovering yesterday's dollar. It's about 70 cents on the dollar that we're actually recovering to uh, provide the service that we provide. And so over time, you know, that puts additional uh, financial pressure, you know, on the organization. We, we don't earn revenue, you know, we, we bring revenue in, but it goes a few places. We, you know, we pay for our operations. We put money in our equity account that pays for our capital program. We send 14%, give or take, of our revenues back to the city of San Antonio. And if there's anything less though, left over, we put that back into, you know, what is, you know, uh, uh, our, our, you know, quote unquote, savings account uh, to serve the community. So every dollar that comes into CPS Energy goes right back into uh, some type of, of service, you know, for our customers. And so, um, when, you know, as I said, when the pandemic hit two years ago, we saw, you know, immediately financial pressure. We made the decision at that point to stop disconnects. Uh, the economy was in, was in a much different place at that point than, than it is today. Uh, you know, everybody was home, you know, nobody, uh, you know, was working. A lot of folks lost their jobs. And so, you know, we did the right thing to, um, you know, to, to suspend discon the, our disconnect process. And we've continued that. We, we, we did reinstitute disconnects for our business customers. We've continued to hold off on residential because we knew the city was, uh, was looking at giving us a $20 million allocation. We appreciate that consideration very much. That's going to allow us to, uh, you know, help 20,000, give or take, of our customers to get caught up on their bills. Uh, and then, you know, we're continuing to make phone calls to our customers. We're now knocking on doors across the city, doing everything we can to try to help people find the resources they need to get caught up. But over that two year period, we've seen, you know, roughly $130 million worth of past due balances that have added up. That's less money coming in uh, to help us pay for our costs. And that certainly has put pressure uh, on our organization. In addition to that, uh, with the pandemic, I mean, the, the winter storm URI event happened in February. And let me start by saying, I understand the, the challenges of that um, event to our community. Uh, it was a broad, you know, national event that affected the entire central U.S. Certainly the state of Texas had its own challenges uh, within ERCOT. But what we learned since that time and talking to the community is that there are things that we can do at C that, that we can do better at CPS Energy uh, and on a number of fronts. One of them is certainly working with our sister utility saws. We've now identified a number of their critical equipment that you know we're, we're going to protect uh, in future events. We have winterized more, uh, put more investment in winterizing our power plants to ensure that they are ready to go. Our power plants are all online and 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 uh, ready to go for February and March when we expect it to be the coldest. Um, so so that that was about a two million dollar investment. We've completely reprogrammed our uh, our system for managing controlled outages. So when ERCOT finds itself short of generation, which could happen any year, quite frankly, um, we, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna be uh, available to do the rotations the way they, that they should have been done. The last event was five times worse than anything we'd ever experienced in the state of Texas. Now our system can, can handle not only what we saw in February, but even additional, uh, you know, required load shed if, we, if, if it's a worse event. Uh, you know, in the coming years. And so, so that allows us to, to provide some additional protection for our customers. And then communication, of course, we know that we have to communicate better, Councilwoman. And so uh, communication is the other aspect. Many folks who have, have um, numbers uh, updated in our system, we encourage you, if you don't have your, your phone number or an email address updated on your account, please call us at 210-353-2222. We can help uh, get that updated so that when we do proactively communicate to customers, which we are doing now, uh, you will get that message and be able to take whatever action you need to, to, to take to protect yourself and your families. Let's move towards uh, discussing the, our, our rate request. Back in August, we, 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 when we're looking at our financials, when making projections on some major investments that we're going to have to make over the next 10 years, and in the electric utility and gas utility sector, we're planning 10 years out all the time. It's not just a year or two ahead. We're looking at the next 10 years, trying to determine what plants are coming offline, you know, what plants might we need to build. We've been talking about the spruce units and how we're gonna 
you know, deal with with the need to move away from coal, but still provide power for our community. So there are a lot of big, big picture investments that our utility is going to have to make to serve our community in the coming years. We began this conversation in August with our board. Uh, at that time, we were talking uh, about a number as high as 10 percent, uh, because, again, we had put a lot of those major investments that we know we're going to have to make in. Um, over the, you know, the way the process works, you know, we, once we kind of recognize that there's a need, we will go to the city of San Antonio and work with city staff, with the, with the Office of Public Utility, uh, you know, there at the city of San Antonio, Ben Gorzell, uh, under the direction of Eric Walsh. And we reconcile, you know, where we think we are, you know, they, they, they challenge our assumptions and there's a number of assumptions that really drive a rate increase. How many customers are coming to San Antonio in the future years? You know, how much revenue additional is that are we anticipating? You know, again, you know, they really look at um, all those assumptions and we arrive at what we believe to be a, an aligned ask. What that aligned ask has, has come to uh, is 3.85% uh, uh, of a ba base rate increase. That will raise us $73 million uh, and it will pay for some very specific uh, investments that, that city staff has agreed with CPS Energy that we need to make in order to, to maintain our system and continue to be reliable. We're going to invest, you know, $31 million in infrastructure re resiliency, you know, new smart devices out on our lines to ensure that we're able to manage that load shed appropriately, you know, about $10 million worth of investment in that, you know, a, a lot of investment in continued weatherization of our power plants. There are regulatory requirements coming out of Austin that will require us to make investment, whether this rate increase is passed or not, those are investments that, they, that we will have to make. And so certainly, you know, the city wants to ensure that that our infrastructure is as resilient. And what resilient means is our ability to recover when a major event happens to, to San, in San Antonio uh, is really what we're talking about when we're talking about resiliency. But there is infrastructure resiliency as a component of this request. Um, there's system growth. As a component of this request, we've got, you know, our, our system is growing in every uh, direction. As I stated, we're paying, you know, uh, today's prices, but we're covering yesterday's, you know, revenue. We've got to reconcile that uh, to deal uh, with the growth, growth issues. We've got technology investment to make. Our, our primary computer system that, that, that's really the brains behind the operation at CPS Energy, it's how we pay our employees. It's how we pay our vendors. It's how we communicate with customers. All the things that we need to do system-wise uh, to be able to run our utility. Uh, it, it's 22 years old. It's at the end of its useful life. That's an investment we're going to have to make again, whether we get this rate increase uh, or not, because uh, you know uh, our vendors are going to stop supporting uh, the maintenance of that system in the very near future. And finally, our employees. Again, we are 400 people down. I can't run a utility company without operators and technicians and accountants and engineers and, and linemen and you know utility workers. We have got to staff up. I will lose 100 employees over the next year and I will expect to lose 100 employees a year you know, for the next three or four or five years because roughly 30% of our workforce uh, is eligible for retirement. So we know those retirements are coming and that's gonna put us further and further behind. I gotta have people, good people to run a utility company to provide the service that you need. So when you add all that up, $73 million, uh, and, and every one of those elements is incremental investment that we have to make to, to keep our service levels uh, where they need to be. The other aspect of the ask is about 0.8%. Uh, that 0.8% is for a fuel uh, adjustment. We're setting up a regulatory asset to uh, be able to pay over time uh, $418 million of what we believe to be legitimate fuel expenses from winter storm Uri. We saw a billion dollars worth of fuel cost in that one week uh, as a result of the need to, to put gas in our pipe to serve our, our community and to, and to keep our power plants running. That's a huge cost. We're still uh, fighting about $600 million of that in uh, court that we believe to be unjust, unreasonable, and quite frankly, illegal. Uh, that fight will continue, but there are costs that we have incurred up to now um, that uh, that we believe are just and reasonable. When you add both of those elements up, like I said, it's about four and a half percent 
overall, that amounts to $5.10 a month for your average residential customer. If you use a little less than our average customer, you pay a little less. If you use a little more than our average customer, you pay a little more. The other element of, that I wanna cover is affordability. Councilwoman Castillo has been a huge uh, proponent of equity issues in San Antonio. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, a concept and a focus, quite frankly, that we have really you know, kind of educated ourselves on. Uh, we've always dealt with those who are least able to pay through our affordability discount. Every time we come in, we've come in for a rate increase, we have increased both the discount to cover the base rate portion of the increase, and we, we add additional uh, 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 capacity to, to bring on more customers. So, um, so, so we've inc increased that affordability discount to cover the base rate portion, taking our, our affordability discount from $12 uh, a month to $16 a month. We've added a, an additional 14,000 uh, slots to that, which expands the program. That's at a cost of about $4 million. Uh, that gets spread across the rest of the system who's not on an on affordability discount. So we're trying to do the best we can. Uh, that's one program. We have a, t a number of other programs. We've got a senior program. We've got a veteran program. We've got a, uh, a uh, uh, I always say average billing because that's what we called it at my old company. But it's a budget, it's a budget plan that allows you to, to have a fixed amount over the year that gets you know, uh, reconciled every year, but there's a budget payment plan. There's a number of other programs. We'll always put a customer uh, on, a, on a payment plan if they need a little more time uh, to pay their bill. So there's a lot of help that's available to you. You just have to contact us to let us give us an opportunity uh, to put you on one of those programs. So affordability from an equity standpoint is also an element built in uh, to this program. Timing, you know, a lot, big question, which I know we'll get into is why now? You know, why are you asking right now? Well, on the fuel side, we got to deal with that by the end of the fiscal year, which for us is the end of January. There are some time constraints that are driving this request that are why we're here right now. Again, this conversation with our board started in August. It started in earnest uh, with the city of San Antonio, probably in October when we really got into going line by line through our budget. Uh, we've we've been having this conversation with uh, council uh, starting in November uh, and committed to them to have one of these in every district. And we've done a number of other events that uh, have allowed us to get out uh, and talk to our customers about this issue. So we're doing everything we can uh, on the outreach side, but the timing uh, is imperative. You know, CPS Energy is critical infrastructure in San Antonio. We are a community-owned asset. We're asking the community to make a just a marginal investment that we believe is uh is 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 a, is a fair amount that certainly doesn't get us everything that we need but it keeps us focused on the next two years and gets us absolutely what we got to have uh, to keep service levels where they need to be and do some planning for the future and so uh, i know it's a difficult ask uh, it's never a good time to ask for a rate increase i appreciate um the the dialogue and the candor from our elected officials and our board about where we are and, and why we need this right now. Uh, and Councilwoman, um, um, we're willing to ask any, answer any questions that, that your constituents have. Great, thank you, Rudy. A couple of questions that have been submitted to the District 5 office. We can go ahead and let me know who would like to answer the question. The first question is, uh, can CPS mail out quarterly newsletters or have quarterly town halls that inform public about spending improvements and happenings to increase uh, happenings to increase transparency and accountability? Can you repeat it just real quick? Just so you're saying is, will we host events? I, I will tell you that one of the first things I did when I became a trustee was to really work on that. And I will tell you, I live in District 7 on Menifee, not too far from here, actually eight miles from here. And I will tell you that at that time, Rudy had a different role and he he actually did listen. And we were actually going door to door with uh, those ones you put on the door handle. So we have historically, I will also tell you that I've participated on many, many, many events online and offline. And it seems that the most popular way, the most effective way that we've been able to communicate with our community has been the community fairs. And unfortunately they've been disrupted, but of course we can continue to 
uh, do traditional things and non-traditional things to do that. But I am a testament that I have been pushing historically, not just recently, but for the past three years to do grassroots ways of communicating with our, our, our not our constituents, but our customers. A couple things. Uh, certainly, I will commit to doing uh, a teletown hall, you know, once a quarter. We, we can kind of, you know, rotate council members and, you know, take different topics up, but we, we've used teletown halls effectively. Every time we do a teletown hall, we get anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 people. So that's one way. Uh, and then we also do a CEO newsletter uh, that we can certainly share. We probably do it more frequently than quarterly, but but it is something that uh, that we will continue doing in the in the coming months. I think that's a, those are both great ideas. Sounds good. Thank you, Jane and Rudy. The next question is, what's going on with city lawsuit against gas companies that gouge rate payers during the storm? And how much of the proposed increase is CPS passing down from those costs from the storm to rate payers? And I believe you touched on this. Yeah, I'll just reiterate, you know, uh, we, I get this question at every town hall. Why can't you go to the federal government or the state government to get them to pay for this? The, we've asked the state government, state government took no action. There's no money at the federal level for utilities. Typically it's for cities and counties and governmental entities, but for operating costs, the federal government doesn't provide utility uh, with any money. So for us, uh, we have been working hard. We have settled a number uh, of the lawsuits for value for our customers in the years ahead. Um, there are still the, the main lawsuit that, that, and again, that's the $418 million that we have paid that has to be recovered. That is, is a part of this rate increase. There is still a little under six, $600 million that we will fight to the bitter end uh, to protect our customers because nobody else is fighting for uh, you know, the citizens of Texas. Certainly nobody's gonna come to the aid of the citizen, city of San Antonio. We have been aligned uh, with our city owner uh, on this litigation and that will continue until we've exhausted all of our legal options. One of the one of the hardest lessons I had to learn as a small business owner was when you were faced with a potential lawsuit, what to do. So one of the best advice I got one time from a pretty expensive lawyer that represented her company one time was like, if you don't fight Janie, then people know that they can get away with things. It was a really hard lesson for me to learn because it really cost a lot of money for me to fight that lawsuit. I ended up winning, but winning meant sometimes when you fight, you don't always get a return right away. That return comes with other people knowing that CPS is fighting for you on your behalf. You don't see the victory today. You see the victory where people understand across the state of Texas, whether they're suppliers or not, that you don't mess with CPS. So even though it's a lot of money, you see those dollar signs like, oh my God, CPS is spending all this money. But can you imagine if we don't fight what happens the next time? Sometimes you have to fight with you know, the giant so that they know that, hey, this is, all you're gonna get from us. And so it's hard to understand that sometimes, but even I had to learn that lesson as a small business owner. And granted, even learning that lesson and being in business 30 years, it's not my first resort to have to defend myself, but when you have to, you have to. So just know that as a trustee, it's not something that we approve very lightly. We're doing it to set a tone and to protect ourselves in the immediate future from things like this happening ever again. Thank you. The next question is, why don't we have a public vote to decide on a rate hike? There's a process and CPS Energy has to trust in the process. Um, you know, from, from the way our governance is set up and it's been this way for the 78 years that CPS Energy has been in existence, we've got an independent board. We've got to, you know, validate that there's a need at, at our board before it goes to city council uh, for a vote. The, the city is our regulator. The city has to, um, you know, really, you know, uh, uh, there's other council uh, uh, members who've asked about audits. The city really does a full audit on our budget to ensure that, you know, that they know what, you know, we're spending money on, how we're spending money, you know, what they're willing to, you know, to include as part of a rate case and what they're not willing to include as part of a rate case. You know, your elected officials, councilwoman elect you to make decisions. You know, there's a, pro our process says that we don't even go to the to council until the, the, the regular our regulator at the staff level agrees that the need is there and then it goes to council and you take an up or down vote so from my perspective um you know you're elected to you know make these decisions as 
uh, you know, representative of your constituents. So, you know, not really none of our policy goes, you know, to a referendum like that. Um, you know, we got to trust in the, the model that's been set up and it's worked up to now. You know, I, I can tell you this is as has been as aligned a process for how we got here as maybe we've ever had. And so uh, so I really want to take some time to thank Eric Walsh, thank Ben Gorzell and the members of Ben's team, uh, because we put in a lot of time and a lot of effort to try to find the right balance of what we're asking for. I will say, like with any public process, there is always room for improvement. I will say that, um, you know, the community has spoken loud and clear of increased transparency and working with us directly and making ourselves accessible. I, I will tell you that I would not be supporting this had it not gone through the scrutiny that it's gone through. For me to have supported more than 10% was something that I was not happy about. Rudy knew, Corey knew. From the moment that they mentioned that about percentage, I was one of the few that said, absolutely not. I'm not going to support that. So the scrutiny that we've been under and the criticism that we've been under, I think good things have happened from that. It is forcing CPS and how we were viewed and the corporate culture out there to think differently and act differently. So as a trustee, I will tell you that we do have a public process. I will tell you that I'm often disappointed when we only have 20 and 30 people show up. And it's usually the 20 and 30, it's the same usual 20 and 30 people to show up to events. I will tell you that I want the community to be more engaged, but I do agree with what Rudy said. I am there to represent you. I am here to work with my councilwoman. It is my job, my responsibility to make myself accessible and to work with anyone from this district and any other district, small business or not, uh, mom and pop shops, grandparents, you name it, to make ourselves available to change how we communicate and the decision making that we make. And so we will look to Councilwoman's guidance and support to see how we can effectively better communicate. But we are definitely communicate, we are definitely committed to increase public engagement and participation. Because if you're not at the table, you have other people making decisions on your behalf that are not always in the best interest. But I will tell you today, Rudy, the CEO that I support, represents the direction that I want this organization to go into. Thank you. Absolutely. I believe that the book stops with city council and I encourage folks who may not be in district five to reach out to their city council member, ask them questions on where they're leaning and why. Um, and there are plenty of town halls coming up. So there's opportunity for you to submit your question for your city council member to ask to CPS. The next question is, what is CPS's commitment to hitting San Antonio's goal under the cap of reducing climate emissions by 43% by 2030? So CPS Energy from the get-go has been supportive of the climate action and adaptation plan. I've gotten feedback from council members who want to see CPS Energy as a, as a little bit more vocal leader. So maybe the way we're participating uh, on those committees and in the process could be improved and, and we're going to take a look at how we can, you know, really get out uh, up front a bit more and, 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 and be a leader. But all of the goals that set forth in CAP, we have committed to, you know, count now our board has to make some decisions about the future of the spruce units. I think we're going to get on that path over the next 12 months to make some decisions. There will be investment, you know, associated with what do you replace those units with at some point in time, but we've already made the minute we said yes to CAP. That immediately automatically committed us to do some things on the power generation side of our business to, to, to reduce emissions. We have been on a long time uh, uh, decline of our overall emission portfolio. Our carbon intensity has absolutely you know, gone down exponentially from where we were 20, 30 years ago. We know we've got some more work to do. So certainly I have seen nothing but a, an open, honest commitment from our board about their desire to work on these issues. We will put them on the path to make those decisions over the next 12 months. Councilwoman, as I have committed over and over and over again at the city council meetings, we know we got to make some decisions on this uh, and we're, we're ready to get to work on that. Yeah, my, my perspective is a little different. Uh, I'm not saying that the commitments have not been there. I will tell you again, I've only been on the board for three years and we have CAP, we now have RAC, we have CAC. There's a lot of committees and I think all committees are are dedicated to doing the right thing. What I am championing right now is, is that as, as CPS is modernizing its grid, 
that we're also very responsible about building a strategic plan that will incorporate sustainability and taking the burden off low income areas. And so it's a very, um, it's a very complicated process, I believe. You can't just overnight shut something down, what replaces it, right? At the end of the day, you know, my job is, is as, a, as a small business owner who owns a technology company is to roll out solutions all the time. And my job is to make it as painless as possible for the person who has to make a decision to pay a bill on their phone sometimes, or someone who's logging on to do their job for the day. That is my job as someone who develops systems like that. And so I will say that what I'm looking forward to is to a strategic plan of all the things that we've talked about that actually has meaningful deadlines that we will actually implement. And that is to meet environmental concerns and sustainability concerns and figuring out a way so that when we invest in something that the burden is not passed on to those who can't afford environmental or sustainability uh, decision making or investments that we make. So it does not happen at the speed that people want. I sometimes am used to in my organization, if I say today it's blue, it's going to be blue. This is a more complex organization where we have to get feedback through these types of processes to make things happen. So I will say that the timing is great. I do things that innovation takes time to implement and we're on the verge of modernizing CPS to protect the next generations and being environmental friendly and having sustainable, resilient capacity to be able to keep the lights on. So know that we are committed to that, know that we are working on that, knowing that we are championing a business plan, a strategic plan that will actually incorporate some of these items faster. But right now we have different, we have, we've had competing, uh, you know, I always tell people it's been really challenging. We've had some competing things that we have to address and that was recovering from, you know, the winter storm. And then we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic that really has complicated a lot of different things. So we are committed. It is a priority for this organization and we will continue to see what we can do to expedite some of these desired um, initiatives that are needed for our community. Thank you for that. I, I look forward to the continued conversations and um, as well as conversations around the rate structure. Um, Councilwoman um, Lisa Cabello Haverad has requested CPS Energy conduct a third party audit and provide a public budget and process document that examines in detail the organization's finances and management practices. Will CPS agree to this? If so, when will this be made public? I'll talk about a conversation I had with Councilman Harvard, and then I'm going to turn it over to Corey. Corey will tell you where our financial information is on the website because we already publish our annual budget every year. Um, you know, she she's asking for us to consider publishing our audit documents. Uh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna look at that. I, I do think there's a place to house kind of an increased commitment to transparency on our website, where it's kind of in in one location, easy to find. Um, but but. I, I look, you know, my approach to leading this organization for whatever amount of time I have to do it is to do it as open and honest and transparent as I possibly can. And part of that is being willing, you know, we as 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 uh, Vice Chair Gonzalez just said, we've got committees in every direction right now digging in our business and giving us recommendations on ways we can do better. If an audit makes the the of some kind, and and I think. We, all, we, we do a number of internal audits, our auditor, our internal auditor reports to our general counsel and, and has a direct line to our board. We already do, you know, 20, 30 audits a year on, very, on, on various aspects of our business. We've got an excellent auditing team at CPS Energy. Our accountability culture from an audit perspective and the action items that result from that is excellent. Now, let me just tell you, I just had a meeting with our auditor, Matt Mills, this past week, and he does a fantastic job making sure that we're accountable to our policies and those things. Uh, the, the, the board has asked us to look at our expense policy in light of some of the recent uh, media coverage on, on one of our executives. That, that, that incident is not reflective of the culture of CPS Energy. And I'm gonna keep saying that over and over and over again. Our executives are good people. They are public servants. They, th those that remain at CPS Energy who are, who are all capable and, and have a heart of service are committed to the type of organization and expectations that I'm certainly trying to exhibit uh, as a leader of this organization. So 
we're, you know, again, we have not pushed back in any way, shape or form on any of the accountability measures that the community has asked us to consider. Um, and certainly the information about our budget, you know, is there. So, Corey, I want you to talk about where you can go to find that information real quick. All right, thank you, Rudy. Uh, so, absolutely, if you go on our website, um, there's a financial information tab on the front page. There's a couple of things you'll find on there. Um, you can find our audited financial statements that Rudy was talking about. Um, every year we have a you know external third party do an audit of our financials uh, and write an opinion letter. And so that is on our website along with the the information. The other thing that, as Rudy had mentioned, was you know every year we'll post a it's a budget book um, that that outlines um, you know what we're intending to spend dollars on. This was actually a conversation and a recommendation by uh, Ben Gorzell's team as well. Um, and I, I think some others on council to to be to have a you know a more robust uh, product, and I think we're going to take that feedback to heart, and we'll we'll build that out. The last thing I'd say, if you're looking for kind of real time updates on what our financials are looking like, every month um, I write a, a report, and it's on our website. If you go to the the tab that um, goes to our board of trustee meetings, and you go to each month, you'll find a monthly financial update. It's got a written narrative, and it's got a handful of slides. That are posted and we post that typically right after the board meeting and that's a monthly snapshot of how we are doing that would encourage everyone to who's interested to go check any of those things out probably the fourth thing that's on there as well on our website every time we do a debt issuance we also have incredibly large documents that we disclose both to our investors and we put on our website as well hundreds of pages um, it will tell you the life story and history of cps energy uh, and real-time information. There's a, a wealth of information out there. I think what we can do is make that more visible for folks um, so that we can have the right transparency and folks can access it whenever they need to. But I, I think at the end of the day, what, what I'm hearing is that we lost trust and our ability to, to lead and to operate an organization recently. Um, and, and again, I, I think when people lose trust, there's a higher demand for transparency and accountability and and look at every little thing and i think that's great i think that from you know we might not always like the scrutiny that we're under but that again is an opportunity for us to reimagine how we work with city council and other individuals to rebuild trust but mainly to rebuild a strategic plan that will meet the needs of different districts district six district eight district two district three district i mean all of them and I think as a chairman, excuse me, not the chairman, but as a vice chair or just, just a representative of CPS and as a citizen, I am committed to, to working with a third party uh, to develop a strategic plan to see how we can more effectively make investments in our community for resiliency, environmental concerns and sustainability, how we can be a bigger economic engine in our community, how we can be a better steward of you know, uh, the revenue that comes in and make better decision making at CPS. And so I slightly view it different. I, I am a champion of working with city and council to do a third party business plan that would look at a lot of elements, but not necessarily, you know, I think audits are there already. That, that process is already there. What is not there, in my opinion, is a clear definition and how we're going to work with all the districts and, and a growing city to meet the numerous demands that we're going to have to meet for the new CP, the new you know, modernization of our grid to meet all the demands of a fairly large city that's growing faster than we can keep up with. So I do welcome the opportunity to work with the third party to see how we can develop that plan to meet current needs, immediate needs in the in the short term, like you know, even 15 months, and then where we're going to be in three to five years. I think that's a great recommendation from city council it will provide us a good map to figure out what where workforce looks like where the advancements will look like but as far as you know again the the information is out there yes of course we can we can publicize it all day long our financials are online we can do that all day long but how do we make that very complicated data meaningful to you i think at the end of the day you want action from us and that's again where I need your feedback. I need you to be at the meetings. I got to make sure that I work with my councilwoman to ensure that those numbers, the plus one and two equal three, where does those three dollars go and make sure that they go into district five. So I think again, that's the opportunity for us to continue to work with you. Regardless, we can post numbers all day long. 
but you want results and that is our job to figure out how we make those results in an affordable and safe and way for our districts. Thank you, Janie and Rudy. Our next question is, does the price depend on how much electricity I use or is the price fixed? Great question. Uh, both the base rate increase and the fuel component on the regulatory asset are uh, based on your energy usage. So if you use less, if you're able to conserve uh, more energy in your home or business, you'll pay less uh, under the rate case. And obviously if you use more, you'll pay more. Yes, ma'am, so it's not fixed. Yeah, and just as a resource for those uh, watching online, if you go to cpsenergy.com slash rate case, we have a bill estimator online. So you can go and, and look at something specific to your home or business for um, uh, for what the estimated impact would be for your unique scenario. So just a resource out there that's new this year. And the only thing that I would add, if, if you're in charge of a homeowner association, a parish, uh, an organization that's committed to the community, uh, please ask us for education programs. I will give you an example. I, by accident, became uh, uh, a landlord. I actually have several houses in this area and they ended up buying them because my family were losing them because they couldn't pay property taxes. They wanted to stay in their homes, so I ended up rescuing their homes. And this whole week alone, I went to most of the homes because we're putting up the thermostats and then we're breaking you know, breakers because they can't handle it. And then your, your bills are gonna be high. It is important that we also, as, as, as leaders, and, and, and we help our neighbors to educate them to be very careful about, again, just raising that thermostat because we're cold. And I get a lot of houses aren't insulated, and that's why we have a weatherization program. I encourage you to apply for that. But education is a big component to helping our citizens also uh, not increase their bills during this time where the weather is just so sporadic. And so please again, reach out to us if you're not, if you're again a nonprofit organization so we can go out there and see how individuals can qualify for the weatherization program, how they can qualify for utility assistance program and how can we also create awareness and best practices to stay warm still and then also not drive up the cost of utility bills, especially during this extreme weather that we, we have. It's hot, it's cold, it's hot, it's cold. So I know all of us are struggling to figure out how to, how to find the right balance and I have increased bills during this time. Thank you. Yeah, as I've expressed a concern for me as a representative of District 5 is that we know a lot of our residents are on fixed incomes or are living off of a fixed budget. And a concern that you know I have is that folks who are budgeting and what that $3, $5 increase may mean um, for turning on the heat or the AC in our, in our summer. Because we know with you know, the climate change, we are only going to be experiencing more extreme weather conditions. So that is a, a deep concern that I have as a representative of District 5. Um, and our next question, it's a statement and then a question, says, if CPS is fighting for us, why are they trying to raise rates for working class folks across San Antonio? Why not put the rate hikes on some of the heavier consumers of energy like HEB, AT&T Center, et cetera? So the impact of, the, of this uh, rate request on businesses is actually larger on a percentage basis than the impact on our residential customers. So uh, in San Antonio, when you look at what it, what it costs us to serve different classes of customers, you know, residential, and even commercial, you got small business, you got medium business, you got different very variations uh, of large business. The the cost, the 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 way we just, we allocate, you know, those costs to serve our customers. Businesses play a little more. They pay about 110 percent of how they use our system, give or take. And residential customers pay closer, you know, to the low 90 percent of how they use uh, our system. And so I know that's a that, that's an ongoing policy conversation that we're having as it relates to rate design and, you know, equity and, and uh, utility burden and how, uh, you know, we're gonna create, our, I mean, kind of design our rates going forward. But in this rate case, um, you know, that for on average, our residential customers are gonna see about a 3.3% bill impact. And our commercial customers on average are gonna see about a 3.7% percent rate impact. So I just want to make that clear. The business customers are going to see a little higher impact than our residential customers are on average. 
because it's my understanding that some large commercial and industrial um, folks have specific contracts with uh, different agreements. Uh, is that accurate? So, yes, uh, we do have contracts when we put our, our commercial customers on a specific rate. They have to qualify for that rate based on how they use our energy. So, so, so we do sign contracts, but those contracts are based on a rate that city council approves. So we're not, we don't go out cutting kind, of, kind of special deals with customers that, you know, that we have different rate classes that council has approved. We'll sign a contract based on, you know, kind of how they intend to use our system and how they need us to serve them. But it's all based on a rate class that is pre-approved by city council and our board for that matter. Yeah, and it's open to anyone who qualifies, you know, based on the, the qualification criteria of that rate. Thank you. We have a, a large amount of questions still left. I'll ask a couple more and then we can wrap up and uh, we'll submit the questions that are left unanswered and then uh, send that back out to community. So um, if you are regularly auditing items, why didn't you catch those large expenses reported? So by the definition of our policy, um, you know, the expenses that were you know reported on weren't necessarily, you know, out of policy, but when you apply a public lens to it, it certainly, you know, uh, gives the appearance of, of being excessive. I have, you know, we, we have to reflect what a publicly owned entity, you know, looks like when it comes to, you know, how, you know, our, our employees are spending dollars. I can tell you, we have had uh, a, 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 a kind of an expense freeze over the last few years because of the pandemic. Uh, in place, there's not been a lot of spending going on. Nobody's traveling. You know, I mean, there are things that we would normally do under under normal operation just hasn't you know happened because you know of the pandemic and the concern. Right now, our concern is having enough people uh, to to quite frankly maintain our system. We got close to 200 people right now uh, impacted by the pandemic that are home because they're either infected or they've been exposed or whatever the case might be. Just like the city does. I know Eric. Is dealing with this, you know, with this issue like everybody else is. So, so again, the accountability culture, you know, the audit's not going to catch, you know, necessarily spending that says that's within the policy. But when you look at it, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to be approving anything that looks as excessive to me. And if I see uh, expenses coming to me that I believe aren't appropriate, we'll have a conversation, you know, between me and my leadership team, and we'll deal with that. Um. So, um. So again. It was within the policy, but that doesn't make it right. And I think that's, you know, the, the what the community ex should expect to hear out of the CEO of an organization like CPS Energy is, you know, the, and 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 the board has actually asked us to look at this, to look at the guidelines, and make sure we tighten them up so that something like this doesn't happen again. In my role in in my small company, most of us, uh, I part of part of our job is you do take people out to E, you reward your employees, we call it employee morale. And there are times, yes, where you spend more than you probably do the entire year for employee morale. But again, um, what we do, what I will tell you that as a uh, trustee, our chairman made it a point to revise the policy immediately. And so got unanimous support from the entire uh, board of trustees to update the policy to ensure that there's a limit to what we call employee morale or, or meals and expenses, because it is the right thing to do. You know, Rudy knows, I give him a call, I said, hey, new year, got to tighten that belt. Got to figure out how we're going to do more with less. I mean, we're in an environment where we have to learn to do more with less just because of what we're all being faced. We're all constrained right now. And so just know that the chairman and I are very committed to, you know, revising policies that are not, you know, again, um, in today's environment, every penny counts. Every penny counts. Even in my own company, I'm cutting my salary by 10%. Whatever it's gonna take to make sure that we support, we survive this uh, pandemic. And so it's not just about the rate increase, it's doing the right thing because times are really tough for everybody and we have to be responsible stewards of what comes in. Our last question is, how exactly do you plan to in increase transparency with those of us who pay these bills and fund those salaries when the open when the open to the public in person meetings are held when most are work most working class people are clocking into work or are getting ready to go to work how are we supposed to make our voices heard with practices like that it's always interesting when when i get this question because um you know 
our meetings are actually, you know, we have our meetings around the same time that city council has their B session meetings and your A session meetings are at 9 a.m. in the morning, you know, so again, you know, we try to have our meetings in uh, a manner that allows access. You, you can call in, even if you were working, you could sign up to provide public comment, you know, find a quiet conference room somewhere and call in with whatever comment you, you know, you can, you know, over a two minute period from, from wherever you work, yeah, step outside, whatever the case might be. So we, we've actually increased transparency already by putting our, our, our board meetings, um, you know, uh, live streaming our board meetings uh, by opening them up to public comment. We, you can do public comment in person, do public comment uh, online. And when we have, when we do have board level public input sessions, specifically for things like a rate increase or you know at some point in time we'll, we'll do that again for uh, our generation planning process those are held at night so as many people you know can come as, as as possible when we have town hall meetings we have those town hall meetings in the evening from six to seven uh you know so that we can get maximum uh participation and we do we get like i said three to five thousand people you know every uh town hall meeting will come in we're putting information out on the website you know, we, we've gotten a lot of feedback about our citizens advisory committee not being a public meeting. Well, guess what? In February, we're going to have our first public meeting of the CAC, uh, you know, and that will be, you know, the, 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 the deal going forward. Our RAC is an open meeting. Those usually happen from three to six o'clock at night. So we try to, 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 to be respectful of the fact that most of these committees, even the board, Janie's got a business to run. So, you know, to ask her to, you know, to, 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 to come in in the evening after she's been, you know, working all day long. I know she'd do it if we ask her to, and, but, 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 we, but we, try to, we try to slot our meetings that, that take advantage of both the fact that, that our, our, our policymakers are volunteers and, you know, we try to make them open to the public to the extent, you know, that, that they are. So, so I think there's a balance. There are times we will do it. Uh, our events at night, but you know, for the most part, you know, our approach to meetings reflects that of a of a of a public public entity. One of the things that we did that we heard a lot in here, and I believe we did this last year. We also extended the window where people could sign up to 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 speak in public. I will tell you that the last meeting where we got, and I remember because I have my notes. The last public meeting where people called in, we had the most people spoken in the three years that was not a town hall meeting, was a total of 148 people. And that was after winter, Yuri. I wrote it all down. So we had 148 people who called uh, to speak their minds. Uh, since then, I think the average people that call in is about three, five. When it's a, a, a hot topic, it's 20. It's consistently 20. So just know that I write everything down because I'm very, again, I've stressed it over and over, I want public participation and engagement. So I've said it over and over again. So I do believe that there's always room. And as a small business owner, I'm committed to CPS. I have not missed not one meeting. I've gone to every meeting that I've been asked to in an evening, on a weekend, half a day, because I do believe that I should be accessible to you. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Rui, Janie, and Corey for coming in and answering our community's questions. We do have a couple that we haven't been able to run through, but we'll submit them to you all uh, and get a response and then send them back out to community. Um, right now, as we have this conversation around CPS energy, I want to remind folks that the vote is going to take place this Thursday. And again, City Council is now validating parking if you participate in public comment. So we're encouraging that you not only show up on Thursday, but you continue to call your city council member and ask those questions. Um, and when it comes to public participation, there are opportunities uh, for boards and commissions. There is the rate advisory committee and the CAC. So there are opportunities for folks to get involved. Um, we will continue to have conversations about accessibility um, and um, ensuring that there's access to childcare and all those important things to ensure that residents can participate in these conversations. So again, I wanna thank CPS Energy for this ongoing conversation. Uh, I look forward to continuing to serve District 5 and please feel free to give our office a call if you have any questions regarding CPS or need anything. And, and give CPS a call for utility assistance at cpsenergy.com forward slash assistance. 
or call 210-353-2222. <laughs> yes, thank you.